All right, everybody. Um, looks like several of us are here now, so I'm going to go ahead and get started. Um, like I'll do every time I record, I want you guys to be aware that I am recording this session and I will upload this to YouTube uh, later today. So our purpose today is I'm going to go through your next assignment, which is assignment number 12, uh, the subcontracts. So if you look at our schedule right here, it is April the 7th. Um, I'm in the review a little bit. Uh, with the AIA A401. Um, what I'm going to do is actually show you uh, the AIA electronic documents. I'm going to show you how they work. Um, we're not going to be able to utilize them this semester just because of the circumstances. But I do have an assignment prepared for you guys that you will still, in essence, create the majority of the uh, content uh, that would go into a subcontract. So I want you to be aware of that. Now, having said that, let me just bring your attention to a couple more items here. So in D2L, under our course content, I have added a couple more folders. They are the project manual, the project schedule, and a subcontractor proposal. Um, all of this stuff is available if you do have uh, access to Bluebeam Studio for this class. Uh, I do know that there are several people having some issues in terms of technology, so I do want to make some of those basic documents available uh, so you can be successful if you don't have the ability to get into uh, Microsoft Bluebeam. So really quickly here, I did upload the project manual for the project, uh, the Wetsikon Inn, Cafe and Lounge, the project schedule, and then I have a project proposal. The other thing I'll let you be aware of really quickly here is that I do have assignment number 12 subcontracts is loaded in here. So after I get done today, you should have the information and the tools you need to go ahead and, and do this assignment. So it's a two page assignment. I've given you essentially the instructions, step one all the way through step, was it 14, 15? Ah, that should say step number 15. I may fix that and re-upload that later. Uh, so anyway, and then the other really quick thing when you go to turn this assignment in, I will send you an email that you'll reply to and you will uh, attach the assignment to that email. Uh, really quickly also, that assignment that you, or that document that you'll be um, doing this on, I've placed under course documents. So if I come in right here, the is the AIA A401 worksheet, which is simply a modification, um, an abbreviated, modified form, modified form of the A401. So uh, this is essentially what you'll see. You'll need to download this to your own personal computer, your own uh, hard drive, your network drive, or your, your uh, flash drive, whatever. And these will have active fields for you to uh, input stuff. A real quick word of caution, for some reason, Microsoft Edge, if you go and input stuff in here and uh, you try to save it, you'll lose everything. So make sure you open up this document either in Adobe Reader or an Adobe Professional would be fine or in Bluebeam to save your work. Do not open it up and do not try to save it in Microsoft Edge. You will be crying into the night. Okay, it will not work for you. So those are the documents that I've introduced to D2L. Um, for you to accomplish the next uh, assignment in this course. What I'd like to do now for the next few minutes is take you through the AIA documents. Um, first off, give me one second here. I want to drag this icon over here to my screen. So uh, this icon right here, this is the icon for the AIA contract documents. And it's really nice because the 
American Institute of Architects, they have all these contract documents. It used to be that we'd have to get the paper copies and we'd have to go in on electric typewriter and we would have to fill in the form. Uh, the nice thing about how the electronic AIA documents work is simply you create databases, they have template forms and everything merges together. And that's what I wanna show you guys today, how that essentially is gonna work. So what you're seeing on the screen right here is the main um, user interface for the AIA contract documents. This version I have right now is not the, um, it's not the proprietary version. If you look over here in the uh, right hand corner, this is a student edition. Okay. Um, the previous two years, they had an online, it was a web-based uh, student edition that we were able to do things. I don't know quite what's gone on internally at the uh, AIA, but they've shut that down temporarily. We do have access uh, from, uh, for the student edition, but it's now back on the individual uh, computers and since we're not in or on campus in AEC uh, specifically in our computer lab in AEC 114 we don't have access to this right now so anyway this is our main user interface uh, let me just go across the top here really quickly we've got uh, five tabs uh, home project templates contacts and help so let me jump over here really quick to contacts. I've taken the liberty and I've put four contacts into this right now. Uh, these contacts are um, information. Uh, the, these contacts are basically the, the contact information for our project. So um, what you'll notice right here is that I've got a uh, contact. I've got uh, basically one owner in here. I've got a one contractor in here. I've got one subcontractor here and I've got the architect in here. You can continually build this database with all sorts of different entities and for myself as a general contractor most of those entities would be in the form of a subcontractor list. So as a general contractor if you're an FCI, if you're a Shaw, or some other, you tend to work multiple times with the same uh, subcontractors, especially if you're Shaw or FCI here in the Grand Valley, uh, you're gonna be building all kinds of buildings, you're likely gonna be working with multiple uh, or the same subcontractors uh, in multiple different contracts. So you would build them in that database. Uh, same thing with an architectural firm. A lot of general contractors, uh, because they specialize in a certain type of work, as does architects specialize in specific type of designs, you may have the same type of architects you're working with. So that's uh, where the contacts are. Over here on the left-hand side, I can add contacts by hitting my new contact and then enter the, the correct information. Uh, over here on templates, let me just go through this really quickly. I know I haven't spent a lot of time talking about the AIA documents, but the AIA has different series. So if you notice right here, we've got series A, B, C, D, E, and G. I'm gonna go ahead and expand series A. These are all of the contract documents that belong under series A. So you can tell really quickly that the AIA has a complete huge arsenal of different types of documents that can be utilized. So uh, here's our AIA A101. This is a standard form agreement, a stipulated sum between owner and contractor. The AIA 102 is the cost plus a fee with GMP. So that's our guaranteed maximum price contract. If I come down here further, um, as we looked at earlier in the semester, here's our AIA A201, which is the general conditions to the contract for construction. And then what we're gonna be focusing on uh, over the course of the next little bit is the A401, which is the contractor agreement with a subcontractor. And so that's what we'll be focusing on. Uh, series B, I haven't done a lot with Series B, but that tends to be more of a, 
excuse me, that's not Series B that low. Um, that is your owner architect agreement. So just like an owner has a contract with a general contractor, an owner would also enter into a contract with a, an architect, for example, to provide design services. And that form that would be entered into would be the B101. Uh, coming down further, uh, we have Series C, which has a few things in there. Again, I'm not real familiar with C. Uh, I don't get familiar till we get down to Series G, and as we go through the rest of the semester, I will introduce you guys to the G701, which is our change order form, the G702, which is our application and certificate for payment, and then associated with the G702 is the G703, which is our continuation sheet. I will show you uh, in a few weeks from here how to use each of those documents as well. So you can see that from uh, Series A all the way down, there is a lot of uh, forms that uh, can be utilized from the AIA. Now the nice thing, if you do purchase the AIA co contract package, you have access to all of these. Um, it seems like the last time I checked, an annual subscription for the AIA contract documents runs about $1,200. And uh, in some cases, that might be worth it. In other cases, it may not. It just depends on how many forms you may be using throughout the year. Okay, so let me come back over here to projects. So if you are a general contractor and you have this, you would essentially build a project. Um, uh, you would, you'd create projects for every project that you're going to have. And in that project, you'd put the project information. And so I've taken the liberty and put a little bit of information in here already so we can get started. So once I've done this, uh, the next thing that I'm going to want to do, and I'm, I can already see I'm going to have a little bit of issue here because I don't have all the prep work done necessarily for previous uh, uh, previous uh, stuff done to do what I want to do here. So um, I might have a couple of hiccups here. But once I'm in this uh, screen right here, I'm going to simply come over here to new document. And in that new document, you'll see I have the ability to select from the different series of contract documents. Let me minimize all those. And you can see right here that we have all the series again, A all the way through G. So in my case right here, oh, before I move on also, these are the standard forms. I can customize some of these forms and, and uh, in doing that, I could start from a baseline or a boilerplate, make some modifications. I could then actually save them as a custom template and then I could draw upon those custom templates each time. And then there's a favorites uh, if you're using a lot of those. So I'm gonna come back in here really quickly. I'm gonna click on that plus to expand my series A. And what I want to do today is I want to create a subcontract using the form A401, the 2017 version. So that's the newest version of the A401. So I'm going to go ahead and just say, okay. Now, every now and then you get these little notices that come up and these are really legalities type things. So what it's telling me here is that in the 2017 version, paragraph, they call it section, I call it paragraph, 3.3.7 was removed to eliminate eliminate potential conflict and then it gives some of those other sections. So, so this, if you guys remember, I think we had one time in class I talked about how uh, about every 10 years, they update these things in that 10 year period. Contracts, there's disputes, they go to arbitration, they go to litigation. The AIA tracks that stuff. And what they try to do is go back and fix the contracts to eliminate any type of ambiguity um, that might exist. And, and I'm gonna go out on a limb here and say that something like that happened and they've modified this 2017 version to uh, fix whatever conflict they may have had. So I'm gonna go ahead and say okay at this point, and it should take a second here to generate. 
And when this does generate, I should have a dialog box that pops up. And I can't overemphasize enough the process, uh, having good processing power on a computer. Um, that might speed this process up a little bit. So um, when this comes up, we'll have some other information that we'll need to input. And some of that information will be things like our subcontractor. Uh, one of the things while this is, uh, you'll see that it's saying building a draft document. One of the things that I haven't emphasized on this is this uh, software works in tandem with Microsoft's either Word or Microsoft Excel. So in the contract documents like the A401, uh, it is building this draft document using Microsoft's um, uh, Word document. When I introduce you guys into things like the A or the, excuse me, the G702 and the G703 for the application for payments, what will happen there is you will um, be using Excel. So once the draft's uh, built here, I don't know if you guys can see here this, but here's the little Microsoft Word icon. It automatically labels it working draft. And then right here you can see new document. Um, here's our extension .docx has been successfully completed. Do you wanna open it? I'm gonna go ahead and say yes. Um, okay, so right here, I wanna be careful. This working draft will open in Microsoft Word. Da, 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 da. So, so it's going to have a little add into Microsoft Word. I'm going to go ahead and say OK here. And of course, this is going to open up on my other screen. I'll have to drag the file here open. Or just as soon as it opens. OK, so let me go ahead and bring... Now I possibly missed a, a step here. And just bear with me one minute guys. It's, um, I'm getting kind of a non-response going. Uh, but as soon as I bring my draft over here, maybe, let me try this really quick. I'm in the, see if I can speak switch my screen really quick. Can someone tell me if they can see the Word document right here, Draft AIA? Yep. Okay, so I'm there. Um, okay, so uh, once I get into this, uh, you can see that here's my Microsoft document. And what you can see right here is it's already pre-infilled a bunch of information. Okay, this is where this is really powerful because when I created the project, I actually put in my scope of work and I put in the project location, I put in the owner information, I put in the contractor information. Um, coming over here, I've got the architect information. The one thing that I did, missed, and I'm not sure where I did, but I should have actually selected the subcontractor that I was using. So if you do that correctly, the subcontractor information from your database should have actually infilled right here. Okay. Um, so the other thing is you have this, what they call the data dialog box. And in here, you have the ability to input information. So right here, I've got subcontractor. Let me just for kicks cl uh, click on there. And let me add from my global contact list. So here's my plumbing subcontractor. So let's just see. Once I do that and say, okay. Okay, you guys see what happened over here? that now infilled all that information. Now, another thing that's really interesting is because from when my draft was generated, 
you'll notice all this information came in. Any other information I input after that fact, you'll notice this vertical line that appears. So this is another thing. You guys should recognize this from studying code books that when we have uh, changes made, we signify those changes by a vertical line in a margin. And so we can see that when I added this subcontractor that it shows that from the draft version that that's come in. Um, I also said originally because I don't have the actual prime contract created as part of this as a preliminary source document, uh, it doesn't bring the prime contract information in at this point. So um, some of the things that you may need to input by, by hand or manually here. Well, hold on here. My data dialog box. Let me go back to the project data. Um, document specific. Okay. So under the document specific information right here, let's just say um, I'm going to put in the 20th day of You'll notice right here, I can actually select a calendar. I can go back, I'm gonna select the 20th um, because that's the date that we wanna use here. Uh, I can put the prime contract, which I think according to your assignment, I use the 13th of January. So we can go through here and we can start inputting all kinds of information uh, using this data dialog box. Uh, I can add a scope of work right here. I'm not going to do that at this point. Um, but as part of your guys' assignment, uh, you will end up uh, putting that uh, scope of work in there. So you can go through all this da uh, data dialog box until you get everything filled out and then you have the draft completed. You'll notice that in this draft, it does have a watermark. It says draft. And this is the way it stays until you actually go through and create a, a uh, what they call the uh, finalized document. Now give me one second here. I need to go back and I'm gonna switch screens again. And um, so once you have everything done, you can come over here and you can generate a final uh, let me actually expand that. So to generate a final, what I would do is I would take my draft document and you have to select that draft document before uh, the ability to generate a final would happen. So once you get everything done, you would generate your final and that would be the, the contract that you, would, that you would send to your subcontractor uh, to be executed. Okay, so again, had this been a normal semester, had we not been kicked out of the building because of our unique circumstances in the world right now, I would have given you guys a little bit of uh, computer time to be able to work in this document. Because we don't have that ability, we are going to do an abbreviated version of everything. And so again, let me... <clears throat> Oh, now that finally came over. I might need to just, nope, there we go, maybe. Okay, sorry about that guys. <clears throat> Okay, so what I wanted just to show you here really quickly is what you're going to be working off of. So again, at the beginning of, of this uh, video, I showed you that in D2L, you will have this document, which is basically a modified version of what the standard uh, A401 document will be. So again, uh, when you download this from D2L, do not attempt to do this in Microsoft Edge, you need to be working out of either Adobe, Adobe Reader, or out of Bluebeam so you can actually activate and fill the information in. 
okay? So what you guys will end up doing then is based off of the information, you're going to go back here. I'm, I've, I've done this basically off of the contract I was showing you I would have created in the AIA software. But what you're going to come through and you're going to go and grab all of the information. And that information, uh, I think I've given you uh, source information for everything. Let me really quickly here. Um, I need to try to open the actual assignment sheet. So if you guys can bear with me for one second. See if this won't open up in Bluebeam here. So going back to the assignment sheet, that is intended to be a step-by-step -step, um, sheet to help you guys get through uh, what I'm asking you to do here. So what I'm wanting to do here is I'm gonna come back to this sheet. I'm gonna split my screen. And then, Okay, see if this doesn't help us out a little bit. So again, here's your, here's your assignment sheet uh, that gives you all the instructions and this uh, sheet is meant to be used in tandem with this sheet right here. So I just want you guys to be very careful as you go through here and you enter the information because you don't wanna get lazy. Pay close attention, what will keep learning with the AIA documents, they have instructions written right on there. So it makes it pretty easy. So agreement made as of, and so this is the agreement or the date of the agreement of the subcontract. Notice that it says in words, okay? You don't put any numbers under the agreement. And you'll notice right here that I've got the 20th day of January, 2020. So don't get lazy, make sure you, you fill that information out. Okay, as we go through all this, you're gonna come through and you're gonna enter, enter all the correct information. Um, I wasn't for sure if you had the contractor information or not, so I gave that to you on the assignment sheet here. But then, as we go through here, you're gonna have to make sure that you go, and boy, I must have been on one this morning because I've got another typo here. Um, enter subcontractor information. So you're gonna have to go back to D2L and you're gonna have to grab whatever source information you have. So again, I've got the subcontractor proposal um, in here for you guys, uh, which is for the electrical subcontract. So that's the contract you guys will be, be using. Okay, in our case right here, um, let me see. If I can find the correct document. Okay, so so in our case right here, here is my subcontractor proposal. So this is where I'm in the go to to get a bunch of the contract information. And so when it comes to putting in the subcontractor information, that information should be coming off of the subcontractor proposal. A uh, contract was made for construction on this date. Again, I gave you, whoops, that information somewhere. Um, so anyway, uh, just keep going through and finding that information. Uh, so when you get to like for uh, information for the owner, okay, that is where you guys are going to have to go to the project manual. And let me see if I can remember. Okay, so this is the project manual right here. Let me. So again, I've made this available in D2L. I would recommend opening this outside of the D2L environment. So again, you can download this stuff and save this to your own uh, saving 
uh, devices and whatnot. If you try to go through this in D2L, it's a, it's a fairly large file. You'll notice I have 319 pages in there. And so um, it's gonna be a little bit tedious. But you'll notice right here, there's, there's actually a lot of different places you can get the information in here, but right off the bat, uh, from our instructions to bidders, it has the project uh, information in there, it has owner information, it has the architect's information right there. So you can grab information for all of that um, to input that information from for what you need in the form here. I tried to, in that, uh, the assignment write-up to be very specific to tell you that the source document would be found in these locations. So, uh, within our project manual, you should be able to find a, a scope of work. I actually copied this scope of work right out of the project manual, once again, for the project. So that's where you guys are gonna come up with all that information. And then what's gonna happen is you're gonna come down here to Article 8. So I've, I've basically cut a bunch of the contract out at this point. For this assignment, you guys are gonna focus primarily on Articles 8, 9, and 10. So you guys will be developing some type of scope of work that will be input in the subcontract. Let me see if I can get back here really quickly to that sheet right here. So as I'm coming down here, you'll take note that I did give you guys an example scope of work. So here's the thing. I had a lot of years where my job was to take the subcontractor proposals and develop a subcontract to be, signed, to be signed and executed between us and the subcontractor. Uh, learning how to write scopes of work, uh, it's not really, I mean, it's not that it's challenging, but it takes a little bit of time to learn the jargon and, and to be able to, to come up with good scopes of work each time. Scope of work in a contract is so important because that scope is telling the subcontractor what their responsibility is on the project. If you leave scope of work out, then they're not bound to do that scope. And so you want to be very, very careful in how you write this. I think I said also last time, I prefer shorter scopes of work versus longer. If you look at this sample right here, a subcontractor agrees to furnish all labor, material, equipment, and small tools to install, including but not limited to helical piers required to complete work in its entirety per the plans and specifications section. And then in this case, the helical pier technical specification section is 316216. Uh, in our case right here, because um, generally speaking, you're an electrician and we will be doing this for the electrical subcontractor for the assignment. Um, we don't need to fragment the, the smaller technical uh, specs out of the electrical. It is fairly common practice to sit here and just say an entirety per the plans and specification division 26 electrical. When it's written that way, any subcategory that's under division 26 would be implied to be part of that scope of work. And the other thing, when you go through this project manual, I don't have the uh, technical specification sections uh, part of that project manual for the, the uh, electrical anyway. So, so you can use that division 26 as part of your um, uh, scope of work. Okay, coming down here to step number nine. So I've tried to be very specific here once again. So um, article nine, we're gonna start putting in the dates of commencement, uh, 1.1 or 9.1, excuse me, I've given you the exact verbiage to use here. Again, it takes time for uh, you guys to 
to get good at writing this. And so I don't want to just leave you in the dark to try to fumble to write some of this verbiage. What I'd rather you do is take my model and, and type it in and think about what's being said here. And, and let's just talk really quickly about what is being said. So a uh, subcontractor is to mobilize prior to commencement of work as defined as the start date for each activity described in paragraph 9.3 portion of work of the most recent updated schedule. So let me dissect that a little bit for you. What we're basically saying here is the subcontractor needs to mobilize and be ready to work on the date uh, per the schedule for the activity that's listed in uh, activity 9.3. Let me bring over my sample here. So in my case right here, under the portion of the work, what I've done is I've gone through my project's uh, schedule as my source document, and I've written under the portion of work, I've written word for word the activity that's come off of that project schedule. So for example, again, I've given this to you in D2L. It is available in, in, uh, in Bluebeam, uh, in Studio. But you'll notice right here that I have an activity that um, is somewhere called right here, install plumbing subroof. If I come up here to my main, uh, my MEP rough ends, you'll see I've got plumbing rough end for the lower level. I've got the plumbing rough in for the main level, the second level. So when I come back here to, um, I'll find it here in a second. Oh, it's right here. So when I come back to my schedule right here under the portions of work, what you'll see is that is being installed um, for each of those activity descriptions. Okay, and then the same thing over here is I've gone to my schedule and I've looked at what the working days are um, or the durations that are shown on the schedule and that's what I've put in here. Okay, so hopefully that makes sense to all of you and now let me go back i think i'm gonna have to go back give me one second here so when i come back here uh, again looking at this let me just dissect for you guys this a little bit closer so i made this comment i think in our last uh, discussion that one of the disconnects I've always found on a project is when a subcontractor looks at my project schedule and it says that it's time to do the plumbing rough in or the plumbing sub rough, uh, in their mind, that's the day that they start bringing material and they start bringing equipment, they start mobilizing on the project. Uh, that's not what I wanna have happen. Um, although a plumber can somewhat uh, recover a little bit more fast or quickly. If you take like a mason, for example, or a concrete subcontractor, it sometimes takes them a day or two to move all their forms, their equipment, their scaffolding onto the project. And if they're reading that schedule as uh, the first day is the day that they're starting to mobilize, that's not what the scheduler intends. When that scheduler uh, uh, puts a start date, he is uh, visualizing, he's intending that, that the form work is starting to go into place, that the uh, uh, block, if it's CMU, is starting to be placed on that foundation, not the day that the subcontractor is starting to bring his stuff onto the job site. So when we look at paragraph 9.3 here, what we're trying to say here is essentially is the subcontractor is to mobilize prior to the work day defined as the start date on that activity. Okay, it's right there in black and white that his responsibility is to mobilize early. And guess what, we're gonna talk about this uh, next week, 
But if he fails to do uh, begin mobilization on that day uh, or prior to the start of the work, um, he's already now uh, breaching his contract. And by doing it this way, you actually, as a project manager, have the ability to start reconciling, start trying to manage uh, the subcontractor before it's, uh, it's too late. Okay, so I think that breaks that down pretty close. So then you're going to go through your source document right here is the project schedule. And again, looking over here, you're just going to go ahead and find, in our case, the different electrical activities. And you're going to lay those out and put those durations in there. Okay, so once we do that, we can start going down here. Here's our contract sum. We're gonna input all the appropriate contract information. Uh, let me come down here to 9.1. Oh, incidentally also, um, there is a liquidated damage uh, clause in the contract that needs to be input there. And uh, the supplementary conditions in your project manual, that is where you will find that information. So, you know, what I want you guys to get accustomed to going through this is understand there are source documents that you have to go to to complete to develop the subcontract. And those source documents could be the prime contract. It could be the subcontractor proposal, which is a huge one. It could be the project schedule. It could be the project manual or the actual plans. You've got to go back to those source documents to get that information. Okay, so now coming down here to 1.1, um, we're going to go in here and we're going to input the con uh, the appropriate contract information so um hold on oh contract price information i was like i needed to put price in there somewhere okay so just take note here that there's two li line items here you put a written description of what the contract value is as well as the actual um numerical amount so you need to write it that way. Um, you'll notice right here, my format, um, I've got N0 cents. I put it in there that way just simply because in the AIA contract documents, when you generate the final, it inputs it in there, uh, in that format right there. So I just opted to use that same format. Okay, so just moving along. The subcontract sum is based on the, on the following alternates. Now this project does have some alternates. Our assumption is going to be that none of them were approved by the owner. Okay. Now here's another real important thing that I teach when developing contracts is notice that I didn't leave this blank. I did put an NA, an N slash A for not applicable. This communicates a very important thing to the other person reading the contract. And it goes for a contract, and it, this should go for any type of form application or anything you ever fill out, is by putting a not applicable right there, this tells the other person reading this that I have gone through paragraph 10.2. I've read through it, I understand it, and I'm putting a comment in here that it is not applicable. If that is left blank, then you really have no idea if they've taken that into consideration. Now, if they sign the contract, that may or may not be an issue because whatever you sign is what you sign. But my goal always as a project manager is to try to eliminate any potential areas where there's gonna be disputes, where there's going to be ambiguity because at the end of the day my number one goal is to get work into place on the project on time on budget and all of this squabbling um, disputes all the stuff that comes about because um, i's aren't dotted or t's aren't crossed is a distraction to the project and for you as a project manager is one of your biggest risks uh, of creating a condition where you're not going to be able to perform and meet those objectives of the project uh, of the project. So again, I think it's very important that we recognize in a contract uh, when something's not applicable. 
So unit prices, again, I've given you information on your assignment sheet here that those um, unit prices are not relevant. The next paragraph, 10.4, um, in my case right here under my uh, plumbing, I put a not applicable right there because there's not an applicable. But if you go to the uh, proposal for um, Strom Electric, who's the electrical subcontractor you're going to be creating the subcontract for, there is a $15,000 allowance included as part of his base bid amount of, if I recall right, I think it was $250,000. And that needs to be identified in the contract. And so that's what you're going to be doing here under Article 10.4. You're going to be inputting that allowance amount that's part of your subcontractor's uh, proposal. Okay, Part 12 or Article 11, that's our progress payment. Um, that's just simply down here. We're just going to spell out the 25th day of the month. I think I talked to you guys about this, but this is essentially just saying that the subcontractor has until the 25th day of the month to submit his um, application for payment to me as the uh, project manager representing the general contractor. And if he does not get it to me by the 25th of the month, then I can't guarantee that I, that that will go into my application for payment to the owner. And if that's the case, that subcontractor will have to wait 30 more days to be able to get, um, to get his bill or his application submitted to the owner for payment. Um, I will actually interject also because I think, you know, this is project management. We are talking about um, contracts here, but myself as a project manager, I am administering, I am managing these subcontracts. If it's the 25th day of the month and I've got a masonry subcontractor out there and I haven't sent a bill, I'm not just going to just say, that uh, serves them right and send that in. Um, I am very, or I always used and, and consider a best practice as making a phone call to your subcontractors that are out on the job site. If you don't see a bill from them and you know they need to be there, send them an email, give them a phone call, do something, give them an opportunity. The last thing you ever need on a project is a subcontractor that runs into cash flow problems. And so help them out a little bit. Again, your, um, your success on a project is really dictated by the success that your subcontractors are having. So um, you always want to use the contract to protect yourself, but also um, use it and, and manage it and help your subcontractors uh, to be successful as well. Um, okay, so going to article number... 15. So I think we end up skipping now, now to the next page. Um, this is actually an interesting thing right here. Uh, as I practice as a project manager, our company never really recognized this. I don't remember it being in the AIA back when we were using the 1997 version. In fact, I might have started with the 1987 version of the AIA. But here's the thing. Uh, let me just read through this really quick. Uh, paragraph 15.2, payments due and unpaid under the subcontract shall bear interest from the date payment is due at such rate as the parties may agree upon in writing or in absent thereof at the legal rate prevailing from time to time at the place where the project is located. So um, I do remember the owner of the company I worked for just saying, you know, we don't, we don't pay our subcontractors interest. And there were actually times, uh, I'm not going to say that my companies ever did this, but I had heard of companies that would hold on to the subcontractors money and, and they would be making some interest off of it in some type of uh, investment or, or even just in a money market account and, and delay paying those subcontractors. Um, that's not right to do. There's, there's some ethical considerations be behind that. But the reality is, if they've done everything per the contract and you haven't paid them in a timely manner, the subcontractor should be uh, paid interest for that money. Uh, 
So that's where this is being established. So you can see right here, um, did I tell you to use 12% in there? Yes, I did. So 12% APR, that's an annual percentage rate. So basically we're saying 1% of the value per month is what um, we would have to pay our subcontractor if we did not pay them in the timely manner per the terms of both the prime contract and the subcontract. Um, when it says down here, the legal rate prevailing, uh, a lot of times these uh, APRs, that percentage, that's going to be based off of the terms and conditions of, let's say, uh, a subcontractor going out and borrowing money. So most companies, they have to operate under a line of credit, meaning a, a financial institution like a bank. They are going to be um, giving uh, a line of credit, essentially, for a company that they can borrow and pay back in a revolving door fashion. But any time a contractor or a business entity has money borrowed, they are going to get charged interest on that. Okay, if that financial institution is charging that subcontractor a 12% APR, then by every right, the owner, the general contractor, whoever is not paying those funds um, that are due and payable, uh, the right for that subcontractor should be compensated for the, uh, the interest they're paying in that, in that cash flow or in that, uh, that operating loan um, line of credit. And so, I mean, that's just one way that you would go through and figure uh, what that percentage would be. Um, retainage, so retainage, I know we didn't really define that a whole lot in class, but this is an amount of a percentage of what's due to the subcontractor or to the general contractor that's held back until a certain stage of the project. So we're just gonna say that we've got 10% retainage. We'll come back to this when we do our applications for payment uh, in several weeks from now. Um, the enumeration of documents, there's two things here. We're not gonna do anything with them other than in paragraph 16.1.3, uh, the following modification to the prime contract, if any, issued subsequent to the execution of the owner contractor agreement, but prior to the execution of this agreement. So what this means, and this does happen, let's just say I go into contract with, a, uh, with, our, with our owner, uh, Montgomery Holdings Company for this project, and let's say after I enter into that prime contract, they uh, reissue some drawings, and in those drawings, the plumbing system has been redesigned in the lower level. Okay, and so we go through and we execute um, a modification to the prime contract, meaning basically we're going to adjust what that uh, prime contract is. Now, suppose that we haven't entered yet into a subcontract with our subcontractor. Okay, if that was the scenario, that is what paragraph 16.1.3 is all about. We would go back and we'd have to identify that from the original contract, we've ha had this change and this is the date of what that change was. So we would need to make any or we need to identify those things. Um, other types of documents that we would want to enumer enumerate in here. Um, we're not going to do this. I didn't give you a space for this, but if there's any other documents, I on many occasions had subcontractors that insisted that their offer, meaning their subcontractor proposal, became part of the contract. If that was the case, it would be under 16.1.4.2 other documents where we would list the name and date of that proposal. Okay, and um, so that's where that would happen. We're going to um, refrain from doing that on this exercise. Okay, the final two places here that you'll fill out, and I want you guys to pay close attention to this. I will have you, um, I think I gave you the information for both. You will enter as the project, um, huh. Yeah, I was in a rush, guys. So this should be Tyler J. Hansen, 
project manager. Uh, that will be the contractor signatory. And then um, the subcontractor name. Okay, I've got this. Um, I'm going to tell you guys right now, I'm in the re... I'm going to repost this into D2L and make just a couple of typo uh, clarifications here because I do not believe our per, uh, oh no, never mind, never mind, never mind. Our subcontract uh, proposal, I keep getting this confused because I've been doing the plumbing one and, and you guys will be doing the electrical. So the electrical subcontract does have uh, the name and the uh, title of, I believe the owner and you will input that name over here under the subcontractor, okay? This is not the signature that you guys are putting in at this point. You're just doing the printed name and title for both the contractor and the subcontractor. Do not put your name here. You guys are not the project manager. Um, Tyler J. Hansen is. And the signatures actually happen on this line above. Now, here is another very important thing I want you guys to understand is if you initiate the subcontract in our case, you never sign the subcontract until after you uh, send it to the subcontractor and they sign it. So let me give you basically the scenario that we used to use. Uh, because there's two signatories required to execute the subcontract, you will have two original contracts that would go out. So what we would do is we would take the two original contracts, we would send them to the subcontractor. The subcontractor would go through and review that, whether it was them themselves, a contract administrator, they may have their own attorneys actually go through and review that subcontract. And what would happen is they would um, uh, either accept it or they may actually make some revisions on that contract. We had this happen all the time where the contractor would line something out, initial and date it. Okay, now think about this. If I send two original contracts, both of those having my signature on there, and then... I send that to the subcontractor and they put lines through things and initial it, sign it and send one back to me. What they have at that point is a contract that I've signed that appears that I've approved those modifications they made, which in fact I may not have. So the scenario really needs to go like this. You create the contracts, you don't sign it, you send the unsigned copies both to the subcontractor. That subcontractor has the ability to uh, do whatever they want. They can send both of those back signed. We can sign them and then send their original copy back to them. That was more of the format we made and that was just strictly to, to protect ourselves. It seems like kind of a long drawn out process um, to to get everything out there, but at the end of the day, we're just trying to protect ourselves. Okay, so um, that is a basic rundown of what you guys will be doing on this next assignment. Let me go back to our class schedule here really quickly. Uh, and I wanna just make sure that we're doing things appropriately. So I thought, and let me, get to our schedule here. Usually what I do in this process is I have you guys go through and make an attempt. And then after um, you have made that attempt, I usually have a day that what I like to do is just have a Q&A so I can help you guys get through, answer the questions and, and do what we need to do. So April the 9th, that's looks like exactly what I have here scheduled. So uh, on April the 9th, which will be Thursday, I will have a Zoom meeting scheduled that you guys will have an invite to to attend. I will be here just to do nothing more than to work on uh, or to answer questions that you guys have. Um, a lot of people during this time, we will spend the time focusing on uh, 
helping you write uh, those scopes of work that will go into Article A, or excuse me, Article 8 of that subcontract. So with that, that's my presentation for today. Does anyone have any questions before we um, end this? I guess saying it's straightforward then, or you guys are feeling like you can download the information, you can make an attempt. And again, on Thursday, starting at 1230, I will uh, go through and or I'll be here available to answer any questions.